All right, so reservoir simulation deals with the computer implementation of conservation laws, primarily conservation of mass and energy, sometimes momentum as well, depending on the sophistication of the simulator. Uh, but no more, uh, well, none is as important as the conservation of mass principle. It's sort of at the root of everything we do in reservoir simulation. And the way you were probably introduced to conservation of mass was possibly you had some one-dimensional body. We're, we're talking about flow on a porous meter here, so perhaps you imagine this is a core uh, that you're flowing fluid through. And usually you would take some small slice of this possibly a kind of differential length x, where this is the x dimension. And you would just sort of do an accounting on this little sliver. And so something like the mass in, the mass out, possibly some sources, sinks, and again, you just do an accounting. So you'd sort of just add these all together, uh, accounting for the positive or negative sign convention of whether mass is flowing in or out, and all of that must equal then accumulation or storage. Right? So this typically uh, has to do with the compressibility of the material that's flowing through. But in this class, we're going to solve problems in two dimensions. Uh, we're actually going to write code for two-dimensional problems at least, um, and possibly discuss three dimensions as well. And so in, in two or three dimensions, uh, things are a little more complicated, right? So now we could have some arbitrary body, arbitrary body. Perhaps this is our irregularly shaped reservoir. So this is in two or three D. And in this case, uh, we can have mass flowing in from you know, very arbitrary directions and possibly flowing out, again, from very arbitrary directions. And so to do a rigorous derivation for the conservation of mass equation in two and three dimensions, you really need to understand Reynolds transport theorem, which I always find uh, the explanations at an elementary level for Reynolds transport theorem to be quite unsatisfactory. Uh, you see or you hear a lot of terminology like intrinsic variables and e extrinsic variables and control volume versus system volume and other things like that that at the at most elementary level I, I, I always found to be sort of too complicated. And we will possibly discuss Reynolds transport theorem, uh, but I don't think it's necessary at this stage to derive the conservation of mass. Uh, there's another way to do it. It's probably a way that you haven't seen before, uh, but that's the way I'm going to present it, Part, partly just because you've probably seen it in other courses a different way. Uh, you know, this is sort of a new way. But I also think that it's, uh, it's actually easier to understand. That is, if you can understand one simple concept. That sim simple concept is called the material time derivative. Uh, sometimes it's also called the total derivative or the substantial derivative or the convective derivative. It's an important concept in continuum mechanics. It comes up all the time. And so in order to explain to you what this is or where it comes from, I'd like to start with a little thought experiment. Imagine there's a factory on the banks of a river. <coughs> 
we'll assume that the river is, say, flowing in that direction. It's just for artistic value. Let me draw our factory. So let's imagine that this factory, uh, of course, takes water in from the river and then uh, releases hot water for into the river. And at some point, there's some problem with the factory, and we have a spill, a contamination of the river. So there's our plume of contaminant. And what I ask you to do, if you're an engineer that works in the, in the plant, and I ask you to do is to go out and measure the concentration of contaminant in the river so that we can determine when we have the, the um, spill under control. Right? So if I were to ask you to do this, there's, there's two ways you could do it. Right? Uh, one way would be to go and position yourself on the bank right? and possibly have a large probe goes out into the plume and measures the concentration. And if you were to do this, uh, it's quite possible that if you were to plot, say, the concentration versus time of the plume, that you might see something like this. Who knows? It doesn't really matter. But the question we might be trying to answer here is, you know, is this spill under control? Right? So uh, sort of what we might uh, ask ourselves is, you know, what's the derivative of the concentration versus time curve? Is it increasing or decreasing? If, if the concentration over time curve is increasing, then, well, uh, you know, our spill is certainly not under control. It's getting worse. The second way that you might uh, measure the concentration of this plume is to find yourself or to position yourself in a boat, right? say moving along with the flow, right? moving along with the flow of the river. And again, you have your probe. And as time goes on, you would move through the plume continuously monitoring and just for um, the sake of argument let's assume that at time t equal to zero your probe in the boat is identical to the position of the probe if you were standing on the land, that way we, we can make apples to apples comparisons as we plot the two. Right? And so here we have what you might measure from the boat as a function of time. And again, at time sort of t equals to zero, you're at the same position. And then as time moves on, So this is time t equal to 1, or some, some time t1. t0. t2. So you move along, right? And so then, if you were to now plot that, what you might measure in the boat as you move through the concentration, you might see something that looks very different. Right? So at time t equals a one, a zero rather, when the when the two probes are in this simultaneous location, you'll probably have a similar measurement as to what you did over here. But then over time, because you're moving sort of away and out of the plume, plume eventually to zero, because you know, the, the plume is diff diffusing into the water, 
and the concentration is reducing as you go downstream, then you might see a very, very different curve. And so again, you know, this is possibly T1, T2. Now, but how can this be? You know, we're, we're, we're measuring the, you know, essentially the same thing, the concentration uh, of the contaminant in the river. There must be a way, you know, but we have two di very different curves, but there must be a way to rectify this. Of course, if you didn't tell me, if I'm your boss, and you didn't tell me how you measured it, whether you were stationary on the bank or in the boat, um, I can come to very different conclusions. In, in one case, uh, quite possibly that the, the concentration is getting worse, uh, the, the spill is not contained, and in the other case, uh, things just seem to be improving, but it's really just a matter that the, that the boat is moving along and you've moved into a more, a, you know, a more diffuse area of the concentration as you move downstream. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to identify the positions of the probes with two different sets of coordinates. Okay? So here's our sort of inertial frame of reference, and we'll give it some labels x1, x2, x3. And we'll make the position of the probe associated with the stationary per person on the bank the ve position vector. And that vector we'll label as big X. Okay? Now, this is just a, essentially a label, right? Because it just identifies the position of the probe associated with the stationary um, person on the bank. Okay, so it's not a function of time or anything. And our concentration over here associated with the person on the bank will be a function of big X. Right? It's, it's understood that it's the concentration with respect to this fixed position X as a function of time. And later we'll give this a name, we'll call it the reference configuration. So then there's also a set of coordinates associated with our person in the boat or the location of the probe in the boat. Right? And so at time t equals to zero, the big X and what we'll call little x are superimposed. Right? So little x at time t equal to zero is there. Little x, I'm trying to be precise that these are vectors. So this is the vector little x at time t equal to one is there and little x at time t equal to 2 is there. And so our vector little x, and again, our inertial frame has the same direction component. So big x1, little x2, So at the big X's and the little X's actually have the same components associated with this reference frame, but the position vectors, okay, associated with the probe location of the guy in the boat are clearly a function of time. Right? And so over here, this concentration is a function of little x, which is a function of time. Uh, and I guess in both cases, just for clarity, since our plots are functions of time, the concentrations themselves are functions of time. So just to be precise, up here we have that the concentration 
is a function of little x, which is a function of time and time. And over here, we have that the concentration is a function of big X, which is not a function of time and time. Okay? So then, the question is, what is the rate of change, right? Is our is our plume getting worse, or, or do we have it contained? So therefore, what is the rate of change of the concentration versus time plots? And so the rate of change associated with big X right, is just simply, and we'll use the notation big D dt C of big X and time is just simply the partial derivative of C with respect to time, right? Because, well, X, big X is not a function of time. However, right, so this guy, um, this guy is associated with this position, which we'll call the reference. position. Possibly you might also see this labeled as the material coordinates or Lagrangian coordinates. Okay. Now, over here though, we have that d dt now is a function of c of little x with respect, that's a function of, I'm sorry, little x, which is a function of time, and time. And the concentration itself is a function of time. Right? And so if we evaluate this derivative, and this time we're going to take the total derivative. Right? So if you remember from calculus, right, the total derivative is the derivative with respect to uh, considering the dependence of intermediate uh, coordinates, right? And so in this case, x, little x is a function of time, and so if we want to take the total derivative with respect to time, then what we have is we have that this is equal to partial derivative of c with respect to t, right? Plus, and now we're going to use the chain rule, right? So in this case, uh, we're going to have the fun partial of x with respect to time. Using the chain rule, we're going to have the partial C, partial X, partial X, partial T. Right? And so, uh, you know, C in this case is a is a scalar, and so we have a, a derivative of a scalar with respect to a vector. So that's going to be like a gradient operation. Right? And so this is be like partial C, partial T, plus grad C, where it's understood that gradient is respect to little x in this case. Right? Uh, so that's going to be a vector. Uh, times a vector, well, so the partial x, partial t, right? x, remember, x is a position vector that's a function of time, right? So the derivative of a position vector with respect to time from dynamics or physics or anything like that, we typically label that as the velocity. So this is the velocity. Right? And so what you have here associated with the, the, the time derivative associated with the boat is this is the material time derivative, the convective derivative. And what you see here is you have a term that's associated with the local rate of change. And also, so this would be, this is the, the instantaneous measurement of the concentration time. Or if you might consider uh, using this analogy here, since uh, the little position at uh, little position vector little x at time t equal to zero was superimposed on big X as if we were to drop an anchor in the boat so that at that time or position 
um, the, the, the two probes were superimposed on one another, then the two derivatives would be identical to, to each other, right? Uh, the material or Lagrangian or reference position derivatives and this one associated with the boat, which we'll give a label in a second uh, in terms of a, re of a reference frame. Uh, so you have this local rate of change term, and then you also have this convective rate of change term. And this is associated with the fact that you're moving in the boat. And so this, this guy, again, is associated with what we'll call the current or spatial or Eulerian coordinates. Right? It's associated with little x, right? And so the material time derivative gives us a way to sort of unify um, our discussion with respect to how we choose to label uh, our position in space from, from with respect to a fixed reference frame or with respect to a moving reference frame. And so it's often said that the material time derivative is the rate of change that any particle of material moving along with the flow, in this case the flow of the river, uh, would experience, okay? And so again, uh, is just, just to sort of wrap things up, we're going to use the notation big D dt as an operation, okay, so we're just going to operate on something, okay, uh, and that operation will be partial, partial t plus grad of whatever times the velocity. And in this case, we were dealing with the scalar concentration C, but these concepts extend to vectors as well. So in other words, if I were to put a vector here, uh, th then, you know, say the, like a velocity itself, then, then it would just be dd, dt uh, and associated. So then you'd have, um, you know, the gradient of a vector would be a tensor uh, associated here times multiplying a vector, so you'd get a vector. So this is the material time derivative.